Hello everybody and welcome back to Typical City. A huge, huge three points for Manchester City coming back after that nil-nil, frustrating nil-nil draw against Arsenal. Manchester City felt like they were back yesterday, but I do hear a lot of opinions on the matter of Manchester City, the differences between the Arsenal performance and the Aston Villa performance from Manchester City, in how City approached the game very differently compared to Arsenal. I don't think there was that much difference. There was two key areas of the pitch that were definitely different, and that was more of a tactical change than, a, than an intention change. There was no more attacking impetus from Manchester City. I don't think we wanted to go for it more. The result panned out that way. The, the shots on goal panned out that way. And it was a very subtle tactic. Not that subtle, to be honest, because if I can spot it, most people should be able to spot it. And I've got the heat maps to prove it. But the wide play is where we won the game yesterday. Stretching that Aston Villa defence. Something that we just didn't do against Arsenal. You know, they played four at the back. Both teams, Arsenal and Aston Villa, both played four at the back. So let's have a look at Jeremy Doku's heat map against Aston Villa yesterday. As you can see, very much on the right-hand side, he played right wing. And there's his heat map on the right, staying wide, maintaining that width. Pulling Alex Moreno or whoever was on the pitch. Luca Dini was for the majority of the game. Alex Moreno came on eventually. But pulling him away from his partnering centre-back. Stretching him, creating that channel in between centre-back and full-back. Jeremy Doku did that really well. Really, really well. Compare that to Arsenal's when we had a right winger, which was Bernardo Silva in that game. Here's his heat map. For a right winger, that doesn't really speak volumes to maintaining width. You can see the majority there, the, the most of the heat is, is there, but it was drifting. There was no continuation of width. There was no maintaining of the width in that game. He was given a much more of a free licence drifting inside the Arsenal midfield, which gave... Um, here we are, an easier job to tuck inside and close the gap and, and shrink Arsenal's defence to a point where it's difficult to penetrate. We weren't pulling their defenders apart against Arsenal. Against Villa, we just stretched them. There was no aggressive attacking play. And I've seen a lot of City fans saying, oh, City just went for it. We just went for it. We didn't go for it against Villa. We made a very subtle change. The stats are very similar. The only two differing stats is the number of shots we were, that we were able to create against Aston Villa and therefore the number of goals that we were able to score against Aston Villa. And it all comes down to the two wide players in Jeremy Doku and Jack Grealish. And then you compare it, let's have a look at Jack Grealish. Here's his heat map versus Aston Villa last night. As you can see, same as Jeremy Doku, just a mirror image of it really, a little bit more defensive work because that's typical Jack Grealish getting back and doing bits in the defensive side of the game, but he's maintaining his width. As you can see, compare that to Phil Foden who played on the left-hand side against Arsenal. As you can see, you know, very, very little width whatsoever. You know, we were relying on Josko Gavardiol to come forward instead and, and, and maintain that width. But with Jack Grealish and Jeremy Doku pulling the fullbacks apart, Konsa on the right-back position for Aston Villa and Luka Dinia in the left-back position for Aston Villa, stretched all that space between the centre-back and the full-back. And, how, I mean, think about the chances that we got. You know, the, the golden opportunity for Julian Alvarez, you know, where he should have scored against Rob Olsen in the first half. That came from a monstrous gap between full-back and centre-back. It happened all game. We were picking pockets all game and just finding the, the, the space between the full-back and centre-back. And then, statistically, here's the Arsenal stats, just as a reminder, as just to give you jog your memory a little bit. 73% possession for Manchester City, which is more than we got against Aston Villa. So we controlled the game more, but you can see 700 passes, controlling the game, big chances, two. The shots, uh, 12, uh, with one being on target. You compare that to Aston Villa's stats, as you can see, less possession. The shots... Clear as day. That, that's where the, the big difference was. And, I, and I'm just going to stress the point that it's because of the width that we maintained against Aston Villa. But in terms of passes and control, we had less of the ball in terms of possession. We had one more pass against Aston Villa than we did against Arsenal. And Aston Villa got way more passes than, than Arsenal did. So... <laughs> It was a similar game. Pep's not gone, right, boys, forget it. I'm going for it. Let's attack, attack, attack. Nonsense. It's not true. It's not true. It was a subtle tweak. That's all it was. A very subtle tweak that maintaining width, and it worked. And this is what I want to see going forward. But the problem is, going forward, will, will opposition sides have a, have a counter to, to this new tactic from Pep Guardiola? We'll have to wait and see. But for me... <laughs> 
I'm, I'm going with this now. For me, Jack Grealish, Jeremy Doku on the right, Jack Grealish on the left. That excites me, and I think it could work. It gives Foden that ability to maintain his central position as well, where he's been playing his best football, all because of those subtle changes. So I, w I wouldn't read too much into the, the scoreline and the, the chances that that's it, Pep's going for it now. Not true. Uh, player rating, Stefan Ortega, you know, I'm gutted he didn't get a clean sheet because he actually played really well. Once again, two big saves from Stefan Ortega, as you can see, the two that he's uh, got there. But 100% passing accuracy. I've been on his case about uh, distribution, you know, his ability to play out from the back. We need a goalkeeper that can do that. Ortega has always been the better shot stopper compared to Edison, but distribution is where Edison shines. And it's a vital component to Manchester City's football, the way we play. It's it's essential, but he's delivering. He didn't really require too much because normally he's getting into the double figures for long balls, but he, he attempted five and he completed five. So 100% passing accuracy is uh, the best we can hope for. Another 7.5 for Stefan Ortega. He got 7.5 against Arsenal and he kept a clean sheet he had he had less to do in that game really but the two big saves in the second half one from Douglas Louise was a lovely big right hand tipping it over the bar and then from the resulting corner a near post corner comes in that was flicked on saves that as well so those two saves in the space of about 30 seconds came during the game when we were 2-1 up you know, that's the vital moments that a goalkeeper, you know, you got to stay switched on for the full 90 minutes. And Stefan Ortega did exactly that. 7.5 for me. Really good. Uh, Ruben Diaz, solid as a rock. Solid as a rock. Not too much defending to do, but you can't really ask for much better defensive numbers than that, in truth, really. You know, it's not like we were put under the cosh too much by Aston Villa. But when called upon, other than that one moment where it was a 1-2, if you go back and watch the goal... It's the, the difficult task of Rico Lewis, who'd really pushed forward at that particular moment. The ball had been given away. Aston Villa broke. Ruben Diaz has got two on one. So, uh, there was a little two-second spell in Villa's goal where he was almost three on one. It's like, Ruben Diaz, how is he going to defend that situation? They passed it round him. Nothing he could do about it, in truth. He was doing the best. It was him, and I think it was Akanji, defending three Aston Villa players just attacking him. Other than that, I mean, I say other than that, like that was his fault. It wasn't his fault. There was nothing he could do, do about that goal. It was a counter-attack goal that I think if we were just a little bit more assured, but it's the risk and reward of the football that we've been playing all season. This is nothing new. We've been susceptible to the counter-attack all season. This is nowhere near, this is not a new tactic because City have suddenly won a game. I say suddenly. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Some people get overexcited. Uh, but I, I felt like he was really solid. Five out of five ground duels. He won five tackles. Ball retention was brilliant. Block shot in there. Won his aerial duel. Two interceptions. 7.5 for Ruben Diaz. Deserved a clean sheet, but unlucky not to get one. Akanji, same again. Decent defensive numbers, three tackles, a key pass, typical of him coming forward now, doing that, what we call now the John Stones role, which he's doing a quite a good job of it, in truth. And he's never been as good as John Stones, but he's not that far behind Manuel Akanji. Two clearances and two block shots as well. Good defensive numbers. Again, Akanji, 7.5. Gavardiol, another 7.5. But the, what's exciting me is his all-round game now is improving. You know, his ability to go forward was good at the start of the season it's gotten better it's gone up a level but I'm still more impressed by his defensive ability um, that that's gone up two or three levels as far as I'm concerned in particular in the Arsenal game he shone in that game defensively I gave him man of the match he was really really good he was solid in this game just just equally as you can see with four tackles but going forward three dribble attempts he completed all three a key pass a clearance eight out of 11 ground duels I've been saying it all season, we're going to start... I said it in the Arsenal game, that's what I said. I said, this game, the Arsenal game for Gavardiol, is the start of the road, the beginning of his journey to becoming a, a potential superstar in this Manchester City squad. And he's maintained it. That's two out of two games in a row. Keep it going, mate. Keep it going, Josko, because we're going to need these that level of performance for the rest of the season. Another 7.5 for me. Rico was decent. He was all right. I'm giving him a seven. He was pretty decent. There was a couple of moments in the second half, which, you know, that's not really his game scoring goals, is it? He's got one shot to his name there. That should be two, you know. Um, it should be two. That's not. I'm not making these stats up, but he's only been given one shot. There was one where he, he cushioned it from a pass from Doku. It sat up nicely for him and he volleyed it. That was the one that they've recorded as a shot and it goes just past the post. Should have hit the target with that one. 
almost near stoppage time towards the end of the game and a cross comes in from Jack Grant, more like a pass than a cross to be honest, comes into Rico Lewis, he scuffs his shot that badly that it goes to Alvarez to the point where Alvarez can control it and Alvarez's angle was too cute for him to get a shot away himself. But that didn't get down, didn't go down as a shot because it looked like a pass, but that was him shooting. I can tell you right now, that was him having a shot. Um, but I mean, I'm being critical about his shooting ability. That's not his game. That's not what he's on the team to do. He is on the team to be a little bit more of a controlling player. Be the uh, supplement, be the, the, the complementing player to Rodri. Sit alongside Rodri in the absence of John Stones uh, and in the resting situation of Kovacic who was being rested. And he did really well. Three tackles and three key passes is fantastic. Really good midfield play, as you can see. He won half his ground duels. That's definitely a weak spot to Rico Lewis's game. He's not the strongest lad, is he? He does get bullied occasionally. But five out of ten isn't bad. Uh, and he gave the ball away nine times. Seven out of ten for Rico. Sergio Gomez came onto the pitch. And I've given him an extra point five because I thought he's a little workhorse, mate. I enjoyed him. He clipped the post. Unlucky not to get a goal. I'd love to see him get a goal. You know, I feel for him, man. He, I'd, I'd still not convinced he's up to our standard. You know, he's not quite good enough to be a long-term City player. I imagine he's probably going to get sold, if not in this summer, probably shortly after. Um, but he's a big City fan, and I love that, the fact that he's a City fan, and he never gives up, and he comes on with an attitude that you can never ask more of. Uh, always gives 100%. Quality isn't always there, but still, he came on, he did a job, 10 minutes of football, 75% passing accuracy, I think that's 4 out of 5 passes if I can remember correctly, uh, one shot, hit the post, a tackle, a clearance, he won, a, he won his ground duel, I've given him an extra point five because of the tenacity that he showed, the attitude that he showed and he was unlucky not to get a goal as well, um, Rodri, just ridiculous isn't he, just ridiculous, absolutely sensational player. I don't know, I'm running out of superlatives for this guy, to be honest. It's, it, he's just a, an absolute sensational player and a joy to watch and a, a privilege to have him in the middle of Manchester City's midfield. He, he's superb. 116 touches, 89% passing accuracy, a key pass, two tackles, three shots, one ends up in the back of the net, delightful finish. He got himself an assist as well for Phil Foden's goal. And that assist was just sublime, mate. Knocking it onto his left foot, a quick little tip-tap with his right foot onto his left foot, gets it into Phil Foden's path and Foden just swoops it in, clips the post and makes it, I think that was 3-1, that goal. Brilliant from uh, Rodri. 15 times he lost the ball, but I mean, that's to be expected with a player who's touching the ball as much as he is. Nine out of 10 for Rodri. Nunes came on, you can't ask for much more really from a midfielder, I'm about to say exactly the same about Kovacic, talking about 15 minutes of football, I haven't given him a point five, but he came on, did a job, kept that possession, 12 touches, 100% passing accuracy, in this game we needed to come on, just keep it simple mate, don't give it away, nothing silly, control the game, he did that, 100% passing accuracy, speaks to that. Uh, a tackle as well to his name. He won one out of the two ground duels. He even got a shot away as well, but it wasn't on target. Six out of ten for Mateus Nunes. Kovacic, exactly the same. 100% passing accuracy. Came on with Nunes. He got more of the ball, mind you, with 20 touches, but he got a key pass. He intercepted. He's come on and he's done his job for those 15 minutes. Exactly what you want from him, really. Six out of ten is all I can really give him, though, in truth, because of the the amount of time he was on that pitch. I was a little bit generous with Sergio Gomez, to be honest, but I thought he, he showed himself a little bit more Gomez in his substitute appearance compared to Nunes and Kovacic. Moving on to a man of the match. Who else? Phil Foden had to be. I was a critical of him in the first 20 minutes, to be honest, because he, he got caught on the ball. His positioning wasn't quite right. There was a couple of passes. There, were, uh, there was a pass from Doku that Foden quite wasn't ready for. Another pass from Bernardo Silva that Foden seems a little bit surprised that it came to him. But then he took that free kick and the rest is history. And we can't criticise a man who's put banged in his third hat-trick in a Manchester City shirt. You know, the numbers he's putting on the board now, 14 goals this season in the Premier League, is just absolutely ridiculous. 9.5 for Phil Foden as man of the match is everything that he deserves. 93% passing accuracy as well. Three out of four shots, brilliant. Six out of 11 ground jewels, fantastic. Three key passes. Dribbling could be a little bit better, but I'm being a bit critical there. Seven dribbles, he completed three of them, but not by no stretch of the imagination is that bad. I know for a fact the majority of those that weren't completed were in the first half, but second half he was absolutely brilliant. Fantastic second half from uh, from Phil Foden. And he came off on the 80th minute as well, so he's got a little extra rest preparing him for the Palace game. 
Um, and he gave the ball away 14 times. Jack Grealish, brilliant. Absolutely sensational. Left wing performance from Jack Grealish. We're going to need him. And it shone how much we missed him this season. You know, and uh, it was nice to see him on the pitch with Doku because I think that puts the whole Doku or Grealish debate to bed. We've got, I said it at the start of the season, we've got both players. Let's celebrate them both rather than pitting them against one another. You know, creating a debate out of thin air just because Doku's arrived. You know, Doku's very different to Jack Grealish. But he played them both and both were equally effective in their own right, in different ways. Doku with his explosiveness, Jack Grealish with his control, but equally effective at the same time. So I was really pleased to see them both play. And for me, <clears throat> this is the two players that should be playing on our wings for the rest of the season. I don't see why not. The only area is, is Doku's um, consistency, because he's a young lad, he's 21. That's the only question mark that I have that I want to push at Doku is he will he keep going at that level because he's, he's been playing last few games even in a Belgium shirt against England he was decent can we see the best of him consistently now with the remaining games of the season because we need that you know we can't have an up and down Jeremy Doku and I feel like Jack Grealish with his experience the age his the know-how I feel like he's got that consistency and it comes with age it's something we need to be patient with when it comes to Jeremy Doku as City fans, we need to be patient with him. But Jack Grealish's numbers are fantastic. Three key passes, two out of three dribbles were completed. That's the area of Jack's game that would like to see a little bit more added to it. It'll take his game, it'll elevate his game to an, like you know a genuine world world class player. He's not far short of being world class as far as I'm concerned right now. But you know, if he could add a goal or two to his game a little bit more frequently, but three shots, none on target from Jack Grealish, but eight out of ten ground duels were won. Brilliant. He's a, he, the work rate as well for Jack Grealish is another thing that doesn't get spoken about enough. Uh, possession lost 12, 8.5 for Jack Grealish. Another 8.5 for Jeremy Doku. 80 minutes played, 63 touches, 90% passing accuracy. Five out of eight dribbles completed. There's that explosiveness, that difference between Jack Grealish. But Jack Grealish offered a little bit more control. I say that, he's actually got a higher percentage, pass percentage uh, completion than Jack Grealish, Jeremy Doku has in this game, because Jack Grealish got 87, Doku got 90. So, uh, fair play to him. And he got four key passes as well, Jeremy Doku. And he's hitting the target with the three shots that he had. Two of them hit the target, forced to save. Ground jewels, not quite as good as Jack Grealish. Um... <clears throat> But I don't really want to compare them any more than this, really. I want to celebrate that one's on that side and the other's on that side. Brilliant. And it worked. We stretched them. It worked. 13 times he lost the ball compared to Jack Grealish's 12. There's me comparing it again after I just promised that I wouldn't. But sorry. 8.5 for Doku. Great. Great performance. Bernardo Silva could have been better in this game. I felt like he wasn't bad, which is why I've given him a seven. I felt like he could have been a bit more effective. There was that one big chance that he missed. He actually created a big chance, in fairness, to Bernardo Silva as well. But I've highlighted the big chance missed. It was one of those that he took on the spin, on the pivot. It's like he's letting the ball run across his body. He turns, spins, hits it, knowing where the goal is, but not really knowing where the goalkeeper is because he can't look. He can't take the time to drop and look and see what the what Rob Olsen was doing. And Rob Olsen just made himself big, hits him in the chest. Nothing, uh, but, uh, but the best of what Bernardo Silva could do in that situation in truth. Um, but like I said, he wasn't bad. Would have loved to have seen a little bit more quality from Bernardo Silva. But two key passes, good. Ground jewels, he won two out of seven. Um, two tackles, he's always got a decent defensive side to his game. Work rate, fantastic. Similar to Jack Grealish in that regard. Uh, possession lost 10, 7 out of 10 for Bernardo Silva. Oscar Bob came on for 10 minutes. He always manages to do a thing, doesn't he? Something. He always comes on, even if it's this little cameo like 10 minutes, he came on and he did something, got a key pass and he got a shot away. Wasn't on target, but still, yeah, you know, I'd like to see more of Oscar Bob. I think next season we will see more of uh, Oscar Bob, but for the 10 minutes of football that he played, I can't give him more than a 6 out of 10. Julian Alvarez, I was a little bit disappointed. Well, let's be honest, we need to hold him when he's playing as a number nine that's when we need to hold him to the same standards of Erling Haaland you know if Haaland's not putting it in the back of the net and we're criticizing Haaland for missing chances then we have to treat Alvarez in the same way 
and he's missed two big chances in this game, as you can see. One, I think, is a little bit harsh to be considered a big chance because it was a header that, I mean, he's a little guy, isn't he, Alvarez? He's not the biggest guy in the world. He did his best to get his neck muscles behind it and he got it on target, forced to save from Rob Olsen. But that one in that channel, when he came through the inside channel in the first half, he's got to bury that. That's a, that's a must find its way into the back of the net opportunity for me. His overall play, the fluidity to the team around him was decent. His hold-up play was good. You know, he touched the ball 42 times, which is, you know, probably twice the amount of times that Erling Haaland would be touching a ball in a game like this. Um, passing accuracy was 96%, which is really good. One key pass, not bad at all. Three out of seven shots on target. Three out of six ground duels. Uh, but the good thing is that Alvarez is getting shots. You know, lately we've been talking about Haaland not even getting shots. You know, where the team is struggling to provide him chances. And I'll stress again, it's the wide play. It's the the the, the, the how much we stretched Aston Villa's uh, defence is why Alvarez was given this amount of freedom to get those chef seven shots in the first place. He's got to put one of them in the back of the net though, which is why I've given him a 6.5 and uh, 7 times he gave the ball away which completes the player ratings for me I'm excited the idea of Jack Grealish and Jeremy Doku on the right is the answer potentially going forward we're going up against less opposition now in the Premier League you know we've beaten Aston Villa really now that in the Premier League at least Spurs away is the biggie we've got Palace this weekend will we see that same again will we see Haaland start up front will we see Julian Alvarez start up front will Kevin De Bruyne be reintroduced were they dropped Haaland and De Bruyne, or were they rested? I think they were rested, to be honest, considering we played Arsenal on Sunday, we're playing Palace at a lunchtime kickoff on Saturday. They were rested. And I have a funny feeling that Haaland and De Bruyne will be back in the starting eleven. I wouldn't object, by the way, to the same team that we saw last night. I mean, we won 4-1 against Villa, so I wouldn't object to seeing that. But there may be little tweaks that Pep Guardiola might need to do, considering how Palace set up which we'll have to get into further into the week once I do my preview for the upcoming Palace game, which is massive. But get your opinions on how City played yesterday in the comments below. Who stood out for you as a standout player? Were there any disappointing aspects to the game? Get in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts. Like and subscribe to Typical City, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Typical City.